Okay. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to finish off Rusamba first. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's just one or two things that I, I think are worth mentioning. They're not, yeah, that important. But, last uh, time, last time you ended off, um, you just shot a a mombi and uh, and butchered it and spit briar. You had a spit briar, and some guy brought out a guitar, and uh, some ah, okay. some, some cow was a curfew breaker. <laughs> yeah, you had, yeah. You had a lack of briar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So All right. nice to see you again, Hans. Um, yeah, carry on. Okay. Um, well, carrying on with Rosamba is, uh, first of all, uh, um, I'm now in a six weeks in 10 days R&R &R cycle that I was to be on for the next two years. Um, during that time, and I was still at Rosamba, I met my wife to be, uh, whose maiden name is Annie Stander. Annie is the youngest daughter of Uam Ben Stander of Battlefields Ranch, Mateke Hills. Right. I think it's a name you know. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, uh, that whole thing is going to be part of my story as it, it all evolves. Yeah, um, of course, we interviewed Jan Stander recently. Yes, I saw the interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Ruth Ambo. Uh, first of all, I was issued with a brand new hyena, uh, MH92, um, which was a great improvement on the old uh, Rhino. Um, uh, I think hyena, correct me if I'm wrong, it's based on a, either Ford F-150 or Ford F-250 F chassis. And in the front, there's this huge straight six-cylinder engine. Um, certainly, it added the comfort. It uh, had uh, bullet bulletproof windows and uh, a hardened skin that would protect us from uh, normal small arms fire. It, uh, it wouldn't stop an RPG-7, but it certainly will protect you from small arms fire. Right. The nice thing about my Aina, one, it was brand new. Two, it wasn't governed. And on the open road, say between Darwin and Bindura, I was able to reach speeds of 160, which was quite impressive. Um, it was issued with... Um, uh, 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 canvas covers over the wheels. I took them off. Uh, simple reason being is they created a hell of a cloud of dust, and there's enough dust around in Rusamba. I also took the canvas cover off the top. Um, quite simply, it it gave you the ability to stand up and have a, a very good all round view. Um, okay, like most guys who drive the Aina, um, uh, we we quickly found that. Its off-road uh, capability was was tops, uh, uh, so there was no argument there. During uh, uh, a visit to a crawl, this is not really to do with the war, really, but uh, just something about me. Uh, on the outside of the crawl, I found uh, a little Katie puppy. Uh, it was dying. It, it, it basically, you know, life had just started and life was about to finish for this little guy. So... And he was all skin and, and fleas. So uh, I put him in an empty ammo pouch, took him back to the base, gave him a good wash, and um, fed him on a diet of uh, either spam or bully beef and milk. And he very quickly recovered, and a uh, lively little fellow. And yeah, uh, all my life I've enjoyed dogs. So he became a sort of companion. Um, but I couldn't take him out with me, so uh, he would then impatiently wait for me to return and then perform when, when I got back. Unfortunately, I didn't have him for that long as uh, welcoming me back when he heard the hyena, he ran right under the wheels of the escort vehicle. Yeah. In in our last chat, I told you about the attack on Rosambo and uh, my then boss, Mike Crafter, um, decided that um, Rosambo as, as a security force base was untenable. Um, and as it turned out uh, the Ruchinga base, which is an old SAP base, was empty. So he, he got permission from the jock to basically occupy the base. Um, it fitted in well with everybody. So we moved lock, stock and barrel uh, to Ruchinga slowly after, uh, shortly after uh, we, we finished at, uh, uh, after the attack on December. Right. For those who don't know Ruchinga, Basically, it's an old SAP base, and what the SAP did is they um, they took a copy or a little gomo and flattened the top. Now you had quite a commanding 
view from that uh, uh, of the surrounding area. And the SAP built what a one type facility up there. Um, the, the washrooms, the showers, the ablution blocks, etc., were were tops. There were offices, there were mess halls, there were kitchens, um, and we occupied one part of the base um, overlooking uh, uh, the DC camp. Now, the view is like this: um, the road between Darwin and Marymount is east-west. The base was on the southern part. Then in between the road and us, uh, an airstrip had been built. Then came the road, and then came uh, the DC camp. Now, the road was tarred all the way to Rushinga. Rushinga is where the tar stopped. Also, we had electricity. You know, I mean, now you're fighting the war from some comfort, you know. Um, and the in the DC camp, the, the DC at the time, a fellow called Art Verbeek, gave us one of the houses. Now the DC camp looked like a like a suburb of Salisbury, you know. The, there were nice houses there, gardens, uh, everything was there. And uh, we had a, a three bedroom, two bathroom house, so we we sort of spent the the evenings in some comfort, and then worked from the base um, uh, on on the hill. We had as a military presence from then on for all the time I was at Rishinga, we worked with one RAR. And there are two companies that shared uh, that responsibility. is B Company and C Company, one RAR. B Company was commanded by a major... My God, you know, I had his name just now. Okay, it'll come to me. Um, th there was also a, a, a lieutenant, Tom Fulton, there, and you've probably heard the name of Tom's name. Yeah, C no, Company no. was uh, commanded by Major Drake of the Drake Shoot. And okay. the second in command was uh, the then Captain Lionel Drake. Okay. Um, and they, they swapped around. I, I think they stayed for six weeks to, and then swapped around again. Now, my first comment is RAR tops. We, uh, for all the time I was at Rushinga, um, the standard of professionalism uh, and the courage of the soldiers is is um, one only can one can only take one's hat off. Now, it will be difficult for me to keep on a timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. as far as Rishinga is concerned, because so much happened there. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through everything as um, as it comes to mind, as it comes up. Yeah, look, just for those of our viewers, Hans, who are not familiar with what a Drake shoot is, um, when I was in RLI, I think, you know, there were a couple of parts to our training which I felt were particularly useful uh, in the real yeah. world of, of a shooting war. Uh, the one was Jungle Lane, which uh, which um, came from the jungle school in Malaya, uh, where the guys learned, you know, how to snap shoot um, targets of uh, that rose up out of the jungle unexpectedly. Uh, yeah. The Drake shoot was particularly useful because what you were you were presented with a an open field uh, where you couldn't see the enemy. Um, so what you did is you used to. Uh, put two rounds into each likely hiding spot where you thought yeah. if I was in this field, this is where I would probably be hiding out. Yeah. And you put two bullets into that bush, two bullets into that bush, two bullets into that bush. And then afterwards you'd walk through the field and you'd examine the bushes and see, Oh yeah. Okay. I, I, I hit this target. I hit that target. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was a very useful form of training, which, which was known as the Drake shoot. I never knew it came from an officer, from the RNI, I thought it was some British Army. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First up was uh, B Company RAR uh, uh, after I joined. And uh, I must say at this stage that obviously I took uh, the source whom I discussed the last time with me, or uh, I didn't take him with me, but the the, uh, the relationship had evolved. Um, basically, we would meet on an as needed basis. Um, in order to arrange meetings, um, I had um, uh, established together with the source a number of so-called dead drops. A dead drop can be anything from a rock to a crevice to a, 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 a split in uh, uh, the bark of a tree where you could hide a message. Um, but it would never be near a path. It would always be in thick bush. And I always took great care to um, uh, erase any of my spore, having loaded uh, um, uh, uh, a, a dead drop, so to speak. It was a two-way of communication. 
uh, he could uh, the source could also send messages to me. Um, the, the problem then for me is, is is that on a virtual daily basis, I was running around checking date drops, and the stick supported me, supporting me must have thought I was crazy because we would stop on a piece of road and I would just tell them, "Don't do the defensive position. Don't worry about me." And I'll go hearing off into the bush and check a dead drop, drive on another two k's and repeat the same thing. Uh, I, I said, there were three or four dead drops that we had. Um, right, once a meeting had been arranged, um, we had a number of meeting points. Again, message at the dead drop would give the date and one of the three meeting points that we would meet at. And both the source and I had agreed on this. So even if somebody found the message, they wouldn't know what to do with it, you know. Um, it was virtually the first meeting I had with the source at uh, um, at uh, Rushinga that he said to me, right, um, uh, through his cousin, the uh, uh, detachment security officer, he'd heard that uh, some new recruits had come in and a joint group of... Uh, you know, detachment veterans and new recruits were at a certain place where they would spend the rest of the day. I got that news at, at first light. I would always meet the, the source at first light, uh, which means that going to the source meeting, my, my stick would go out with me in darkness. They would stop uh, quite a few kilometers away. Um, I, uh, uh, I didn't want to compromise anything. And I would then go to the meeting in darkness. Um, something I, I didn't have a problem with. I, I, I knew the bush or know the bush. Um, and uh, okay, uh, there were there were twenty, um, mostly new recruits and four or five veterans from the Nyawi detachment. They would base there for the day because the group was so large. They only wanted to move at night, so this gave me daylight on that day from six in the morning to. Um, uh, uh, to get something going. So I go hearing back to the base and get there. It must have been about eight and see this major. I think just as well, I don't know his name. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, uh, uh, you, and you'll see why. Um, and I said to him, now, from his point of view, he is a guy who is just turned 21, coming up to him and telling him, this is the Lockstead. There are 20 uh, 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 Charlie Tangos there now. Um, please do what you do, you know. And then I went away, did my thing, did my report, called the boss in Darwin. And uh, it must have been 12 o'clock or so. I go back to him. I said, right, you know, what's happened? He says, nothing. So I said, why not? He said, well, you know, I need to do this and then OPs and blah, blah, blah. I said, I've given you a six-figure lock stack. You know, and he didn't quite appreciate me talking to him that way. So I thought, now stuff it. I got hold of Darwin, um, of my boss, I think it was Robin Harvey at the time. And I said to him, this is the situation. You know the source. And when I say the int is good, the int is good. So Robin Harvey, uh, he, uh, yeah, he got quite angry, um, went to the jock. And it must have been within 20 minutes that uh, this major got the order to attend without uh, delay. Now, for him to get there, et cetera, blah, 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 uh, they get to near the area, uh, it must have been three, half past three, they walk in. And then the the CTs saw one of the units walking in and all hell broke loose. And suddenly, uh, I think uh, they were, uh, it was even numbers, 20 RAR against 20 Charlie Tangos. Um, they managed to kill, I think it was one or two, and there was some blood on score. And they bombshell, you know. So they called in fire force, but fire force gets there at five. Uh, they were at the time, there was less than an hour's light left. So as far as I'm concerned, this was a lemon. Um, I expressed my feelings. Uh, I didn't care about the man's rank by that time. Um, because everybody's taking a risk here. You know, the source is taking risks, I'm taking risks. And then you have an outcome like that to live with. Um, thank God I had, uh, 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 in anticipation of something happening, I'd say to the source, you'll meet at this point the following morning. So the following morning, I'm at the source, who was angry. Now I'm I'm having to placate the source, who, who says, how can you guys do this, you know? 
aside from the fact he was looking forward to a lot of money, because for every Charlie Tango accounted for, on his information, at that time, we were paying $1,000, which in 1976, Rhodesia was a, yeah, it was a fortune. I mean, I would have to work for, I think it was five months or something like that, to earn that amount of money. So I took the Caton, and he said to me, right, just as well we're meeting, the Nyahui Detachment Logistics uh, uh, Commander was wounded in the contact, and he's hiding in this crawl, and I knew the head of the crawl, uh, I knew him to be a contact, and he's hiding in this crawl, and uh, you can go and pick him up. So I go hearing back to the base, see Thompson, Major Thompson. Um, and, and saw Major Thompson. I said to him, right, we managed to wound one of the guys. He's a senior officer in Zandla. He's hiding in that crawl. We need to find him. And this is where uh, uh, Lieutenant Fulton comes in because he was then uh, commanding the section of the R.I. that went to the crawl. So I stayed with the Major in his ops room. And then uh, Lieutenant Fulton comes up and he says, you can't find him. You know, we've gone through the crawl. And I'll never forget these words. The major turns around, he says, if Icon says he's there, he's there. Search again. And they found him. He was only slightly wounded. So they brought him back uh, um, to base. So I went out there. I think I went out there. And um, thank God he was only slightly wounded and he could walk. Now, my first priority right there and then was, he is the logistics officer. He knows where all the arms caches are. And before they move them, we must lift them. So we spent the rest of the day lifting three or four arms caches. There's quite a bit of stuff recovered, you know. Yeah. And I've got Darwin chomping at the bit because now everybody wants to take over and interrogate this uh, this captain. I said, no, I'm taking priority here and for good reason. And there was a reason we recovered. Uh, ammo, SKSs, mines, uh, RPG-7 rockets, you know, the sort of stuff they would put in arms caches. But they would... Keep them relatively small, so if one arm sketches out, then, you know, not too much is lost. The nice thing was, thereafter, whenever I went to Major Thompson with intelligence, um, he believed me, and uh, we then went on to have a very successful tour. Um, one was a contact uh, uh, just south of the of the um, uh, exclusion zone, which I talked about, that 10 gauge uh, uh, strip of bush. The, the source told me that uh, some new guys were coming in, but they weren't new. They were veterans that had been resupplied. And they were going down to Matoko. Okay, so uh, um, we accounted for all six. Then, okay, something slightly um, out, of, um, out of the ordinary. Um, it was a cold morning. There was Guti, you know Guti. I just come up uh, to the base from the Intef camp, and the uh, 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 my sergeant comes running up and he says, "So there is a there's a woman there. She's holding a baby and she's demanding to see the senior police officer, and she's crying and wailing and performing." I said, "Okay, I'll see her." And what it was, this woman was holding her, I think it was eighteen months or two year old daughter, who was bleeding profusely from between the legs. Turns out, the previous night, Daddy had got drunk and raped his 18-month-old baby. And oh, this child was in a mess. So we take her to the RAR medic, who turns on, he says, this, this child's not going to survive without an operation. So now I thought, no, we, we can't let this happen. So I get hold of Darwin, uh, uh, spoke to Robin Harvey, and I said, this is the situation. And what impressed me is, this woman didn't go to Zonla or anybody. She came to us. So I felt we should help her. So uh, uh, um, the woman said, uh, said to me, get back to me. And he came back. He said, right, he found a pilot who is volunteered to do this. But you got to take your time because the Guti was so that the pilot was flying like, I don't know, a couple of meters above the ground, but he was following the road. All the way in. If he went up, he wouldn't see anything. Um, so it didn't take that long. I mean, a chopper is quite fast. And the, the pilot then arrived, landed. He took him, they took this baby to uh, Kendaya Hospital, which was just across the Ruya River and run by 
an American NGO. I forget now who they were, but the nice thing is Kandaya Hospital was uh, well equipped and a child survived. Now, to me, the, the, the hero here was that chopper pilot. You know, he didn't have to do this. And um, it, was, it was him that saved this child's life. I cannot for the, uh, remember the guy's name, but uh, I'd, I'd, yeah. So there was just a, an, another story that uh, oh, came out of the shit guys. Yeah. There had been an incident at a crawl. Okay, this is no longer, I think, no, this was still B Company. Um, there had been, there'd been an incident at a crawl, and um, I was going out to attend the incident. I forget now what the incident was. And my escort was um, uh, uh, an RER 25, and on the back were two NAMAGs manned by a uh, uh, Lance Corporal, right? Just before the crawl, we go through uh, a part of the road where the road had cut into the hill. So on either side, there's steeper um, uh, embankments. We were ambushed. And uh, what had happened is uh, basically one of the first bullets took out the engine of my Land Rover. So now I'm sitting there, a sitting duck in the killing zone. And you know, the sound of those bullets hitting the metal is something else. I'm trying to get out of all the stuff that you wear, to, um, the seat belts, etc. And of course, by, by now my hands are all thumbs, and um, trying to get my rifle going. Meantime, the uh, uh, the escort vehicle has come up, and uh, uh, this lance corporal is letting loose with his uh, two MAGs. And he fought them off. Now, in the meantime, I forget now how many bullet strikes I counted on our vehicle, but it was over 30, let's put it this way. You know, the, 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 the Land Rover looked like a Swiss cheese, and it was thereafter, it was useless. But neither me or my sergeant were, were, were touched, so somebody likes me up there. Um, what happened to this Lance Corporal is whilst basically putting the putting the uh, uh, the CTs to flight and killing two and wounding a number in the process. Um, he had been shot several times himself and one of his MAGs had been put up, out of action. So when they were all gone, I got out, we, we called for Kazovac. And at the end of the day, um, this action earned that Lance Corporal uh, the Bronze Cross. Wow. Well-deserved. Yeah, uh, be, because... Uh, me and the sergeant would have been toast if it hadn't been for him. You know, it's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. yeah. Now B Company changed to C Company. Okay, uh, impression of Lionel Dyke is some people don't like him, other people like him. I think he's one of the best soldiers I've worked with. I just want to put that on record. The source said, right, there is going to be a huge movement uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, and then a few weeks, what am I was saying? Sorry. Uh, he gave me the day. And basically, all the commanders are going out for a big meeting in Mozambique. He couldn't tell me exactly where, but he knew the, basically the area we had to cover. <coughs> so based on this, uh, a big operation was mounted um, at the edge of the no-go zone because we knew the pass they would be using in that no-go zone because they'd been charted. And on the day concerned, uh, okay, we, the, the troops we used, they, they, they called up one of our RLI, basically cooks and bottle washers, anybody that could carry a gun went up to those paths. And then all hell broke loose that morning. There were contacts all over the place. Um, so the inter being correct. Unfortunately, for some reason, we uh, didn't account for as many of the enemy as we had liked, but we, we certainly, uh, I forget now how many kills, but we, we certainly put a dent in them. And so it carried on. Uh, it, it sort of became routine, you know, um, incident after incident. Yeah, that was, that was basically Rushinga. Um, I was there until um, April uh, 77. And I must say, by April 77, um, I was having bad dreams and I wasn't sleeping well. And 
uh, I would say, early PTSD, etc. And I just needed to get away. So I I looked at how much leave I had left. And I took it all. It was, I think it was something like three months. And then um, I left with Shinga and four of us went over to Europe to uh, uh, basically forget about things, you know. And uh, yeah, a good time was had by all. So yeah, that was my days at Rushinga. Uh, 